Okay, let's start. Well, uh, we have so much to do. Um, and today I'm going to finish uh, talking about the issue between externalism and internalism. And then I'm going to talk about mental causation, uh, specifically intentional causation. Because remember, our aim now is to give an account of how the human reality relates uh, to the more basic and fundamental reality. And that uh, is the problem that underlies our philosophical problem of the nature of cognitive science and the nature of the, uh, the explanation of human behavior and how it relates to the explanation of phenomena that we're inclined to call natural phenomena, but of course human behavior is natural phenomena uh, as well. But we do need an, some account of how explaining human behavior uh, differs from explaining physical phenomena. Explaining the occurrence of the earthquake in Japan uh, seems to have a different logical structure from the explanation of how the Japanese responded uh, to the tsunami and the uh, damage to the nuclear power facilities. So there are a whole lot of really fundamental questions uh, that we're going to be dealing with, and I want to get to those as soon as I can. But first, let's finish off externalism and internalism. I I'm never good at figuring out what the mainstream of philosophy thinks, but my uh, general experience has been that it's usually false. And as far as I can tell, they now believe in externalism. They believe that the, what's inside your head uh, is not sufficient uh, to determine intentional content or meaning or how words relate to world or how the mind relates to the rest of reality. And the argument that has uh, people have found most convincing, there are variations on the argument, that, but the, the general form of the argument is in uh, Hillary Putnam's uh, a twin Earth example, and the idea is <clears throat> that two people could have exactly the same thing in their heads and mean something different, and that's the whole point of the twin Earth. Uh, that the uh, the idea is that if they're molecule for a molecule type identical with us on twin Earth, then what's inside the head will be the type identical with what is here, but all the same, they mean something different because when we say water here, we mean H2O, and when they say water there, they mean XYZ. And this is true before the discovery of H2O and XYZ. The idea is not nowadays, of course, any educated person knows that water is H2O, at least on our Earth. Um, but this was in 1750, the Putnam is imagining this, when what is in the head is the same on Earth and on Twin Earth, and yet they mean something different, but then it follows that meanings aren't in the head. Well, where are they? Well, Putnam says it's a matter of a causal relation between the use of the word and the initial baptism. There has to be some causal chain uh, stretching back to the initial baptism of something as water. And that's what determines the meaning. It's not what's in your head, but it is in the, in the causal relations uh, between you and a certain history. And that argument, as you know, is extended by Tyler Burge. Uh, and Burge says not only are meanings not in your head, but even beliefs aren't in your head. Uh, what determines what you believe is not what's in your head, but what the community thinks. Uh, your, uh, he, he even uses the term individualism uh, to describe the view that he's attacking. Uh, I'm an individualist, but he attacks individualism saying that what is in your head is insufficient to determine what you believe because it's the same guy uh, same head, what changes is the environment, and in one environment he holds the false belief that he has arthritis, but in another environment, another community, he holds a true belief, a true belief. We can't even say it's arthritis, but call it tharthritis. He holds a true belief that he has tharthritis, and yet what is in the head is the same in the two cases. Uh, now, I think these are bad arguments, but I want you to see the structure. The structure of the argument is that what is in the head can, and I have to say what is in the head and not what is in the mind, because it turns out even the mind 
uh, isn't in the head. Even the mind is now going to be a public social phenomenon. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, we, let's put it by saying what's between your ears inside your skull is insufficient to determine what you believe or what you mean. Now, I think those arguments are bad, and I gave you a very brief refutation last time, but basically what Putnam shows uh, is that the traditional checklist account, where water is a colorless, tasteless liquid, uh, et cetera, that that's inadequate uh, to account uh, for meaning, uh, that you need more than that. You need something indexical. Uh, but then uh, the answer to that is, uh, that the indexical definition is in your head. Uh, that is to say, uh, the indexical definition only functions insofar as you have internalized it. And with Burge, it seems to me the situation is worse. I don't think the guy holds the belief uh, that he has arthritis. He holds a belief that he, a correct belief that he has a certain kind of pain and he holds a false belief that it's called arthritis in his community. And as soon as he determines that it, uh, finds out that it's not called arthritis, he gives up on it. He doesn't give up on his belief in the nature of his experience, in the, what, uh, the actual pain that he's having, but the doctor teaches him what it's called. Uh, and it's generally the case with human beings that we're very conformist where the use of language is concerned. Uh, and as soon as you find out that your use of a word departs from the norm, departs from other people, you'll change it. So what the guy changes is not his belief, but his use of words. He changes. He no longer calls his uh, condition arthritis, but he calls it just a pain in the thigh uh, in the other case. So I think these, I'm underwhelmed, as they say, uh, by these two arguments, but they have been very influential. But there's a deeper point I want to get at before we leave these arguments, and that's this. Suppose these guys are right and I'm wrong. I mean, suppose that really what is in the head is insufficient uh, determine, to determine a belief and determine meaning. Well, all the same, there is something in the head, uh, and it's what's in the head that we're going to have to deal with when we explain human behavior, when we want to give an account of how our cognitive faculties relate us to the rest of the world and how we explain the behavior of both of individuals and of social movements. All we have to go on is what's inside the head of uh, the individuals in question. So I think it is a mistake both philosophically and methodologically. It's a mistake philosophically to adopt externalism because the arguments for it aren't good. Uh, now, it's true, it does force us, I think, to a more sophisticated account of indexicality, and I think that's absolutely right, that you have to see indexical utterances are self-reflexive. The two identical twins both say, I am hungry, but they mean something different, not because of any deep externalism about meaning, but because both use the word I, and the word I changes its reference, even though the meaning is the same it changes its reference because it's indexical. The, the reference of I is self-reflexive to the very utterance of the expression. I refers to the person uttering it, just as here refers uh, to the place of the utterance and now refers to the time of the utterances. Indexicality is pervasive in language. Indeed, I want to say there's a way in which all utterances are indexical because they're all indexed to the background. Different backgrounds will give you different truth conditions, uh, even though the semantic content is the same. As the semantic content is the same in, in our two identical twins, each of which says, I am hungry, but the indexicality of the I makes it the case that they ha mean something different, uh, even though the words have the same meaning. So uh, I don't think there's any deep problem uh, raised by uh, the externalist account, but I think if, if it were accepted, it would, I mean, people say they accept it, but they don't really, uh, when, because when they're doing cognitive science, when you're doing psychology, you really have to look at the subject. You have to look at what's inside the subject's head. Uh, and you have, what your tests are trying to get at uh, is what is the contents, I can't say of his mind, because that's begging the question, but the contents of his skull. What's between the ears? 
still remains a topic of investigation. So even if these guys were right, it would just be a relatively trivial point about the use of the word meaning. I don't think they are right, but it's important to see that cognitive science survives as the investigation of human cognitive capacities. Okay, so I'm now going to get off of the topic of uh, uh, externalism and internalism, and we're going to talk about mental causation. Can you bear it? Uh, let's take questions about what I've said so far uh, this morning, or for that matter, what I said last time. Uh, anybody want to uh, defend uh, externalism, or you think that I've been unfair? Yes? Yeah, do you, are, does your account say that you don't need any sort of interaction with the external world? No, it doesn't say that. No, what it says is that insofar as my cognition is concerned, my interaction with the external world functions in cognition only insofar as it is represented by the contents of the brain. And the way that the brain represents these things is by indexicality. Uh, so I am uh, a guy giving a lecture in Berkeley, California on this earth. If it turns out that there is a guy uh, who is type, as they say, type identical with me, he's got the same molecules, uh, all the same, I am referring to me and not him, I'm referring to this Berkeley and not twin Berkeley, and that's because I have environmental contexts with, with the conditions of satisfaction of my intentionality require that I be in a causal interaction with this particular environment and not with that environment. So it isn't that the environment drops out, but rather the environment only functions insofar as it is represented in the contents of the mind. Now I have sometimes in the past used the, the brain and the vat fantasy to illustrate this point, but people generally misunderstand it. They think, I'm thinking, well, maybe we really are brains in vats, you know. Well, we aren't, okay. I mean, uh, it's kind of fun to think maybe really what's going on is uh, I'm in, in, the, in Minnesota in the 25th century, and I'm in a, 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 my brain is in a vat full of nutrients, and some nice lab assistant has fed one of those old 21st century tapes. I lucked out. I wound up having a, a life in Berkeley, California, and not in Siberia. Another tape, and it would have been a different life altogether. Uh, and, and, and now I think I, people think, well, that's not a meaningful, not a meaningful fantasy. No, I think it's perfectly meaningful for a very simple reason. This thing is a vat. The skull is a kind of a vat, and the uh, a, a sensory nervous system gives you a set of inputs to the contents of the vat. And then what, if you cut off the, the actual external environment, you can have experiences inside that feel exactly the same as they would in real life. That's the whole point of the brain and the vat fantasy. Now, um, McDowell, who's another famous philosopher that disagrees with me, says, but if it's a brain and the vat, all is dark in there. You can't have any experiences in there. Wait a second, it's not in there, it's in here, it's me, it's this, that. And the point about the brain and the vat fantasy uh, is that the experiences are exactly the same. Uh, there's no point of the fantasy otherwise. The character of the experience is exactly the same, it's just that they're not satisfied. It's just that nothing is, actu nothing is actually as it seems to be. Now, I, I, my, many of you may have seen this movie. There's a perfectly dreadful movie called The Matrix, uh, which is a kind of brain in the vat fantasy. Uh, and the movie is incoherent for interesting reasons. And the makers of the movie wanted to make a movie about the movie, so they came and interviewed me. I don't know if I ever, I, I probably got cut on the cutting room floor in, in the movie about the movie, and I tried to explain to them why the movie is incoherent. Uh, <laughs> they didn't want to hear that. Uh, I, I, I guess they wanted to hear that it was really sexy or something. But in any case, I'll tell you why it's uh, incoherent. The premise of the film uh, of uh, movie making, of the omniscient observer, is that the camera is observing what's happening. Uh, so when you see uh, Tom Jones uh, 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 having a dinner with his girlfriend in a famous scene, I forget her name, but she's played by Susanna York, who married a friend of mine. Uh, but in any case, uh, there's this sexy scene. Now we are sort of voyeurs. We are the camera watching. 
uh, this scene. But the premise of the matrix is there's nothing to watch. You see, if I have a dream uh, that I'm uh, having an argument in philosophy with somebody, and that you want to do a movie of that, all I can show is me lying in bed, because that's all, all that the camera can photograph. Suppose I'm having an argument with Bert Dreyfus, and suppose simultaneously he's dreaming that he's having an argument with me. You want to make a, a movie of this argument, all you can show are two guys sound asleep in bed, right? Because that's all that's actually happening. You might say, yeah, but you could show how it seems to me. Fine, then you would show this particular experience with me making these noises through my mouth. What you cannot show is a scene of two guys having an argument with each other because the premise of the movie is no such event ever occurred to be photographed. Hence, the voyeur has got nothing to voyeur about. I don't know what the verb is to voyeur. Yeah, to voyeur about. I, I hope you understand that point because I could not explain it to those guys from L.A. Uh, I have a friend in L.A. who makes movies. He made a movie called The French Connection, and it was pretty good. I mean, I don't go to movies much, but I thought that one was uh, was pretty good. But he's generally unhappy. Well, I don't want, we don't we don't want to talk about L.A. I got enough problems today without L.A. Let's get back to externalism and, and internalism. Um, I, and the point, the the bottom line, uh, there are two uh, messages I want to get to cross across to you. One is I think the actual arguments are bad. Uh, they don't show that meanings are not in the head. What they show is meanings are indexical. But the indexical content has to be represented in the contents of the mind or it won't function. And the second point I want to make, which is really a deeper point, uh, even if they're right, it would at most be a, a point about use, the use of words like mean and believe and not about the actual substance of human cognition because cognitive science has to presuppose that there is something going on in the mind of the subject or else we haven't got a subject matter, uh, to make a pun on the word subject. We haven't got a topic for cognitive science uh, if uh, the contents of the mind uh, are irrelevant, because that's what we're, we're studying. Uh, there is a jargon that, that you will encounter if you read the literature. There's, a, there's supposed to be a distinction between narrow content, that's what's between your ears, and wide content, that's out there in the world. Uh, and then there's even a debate, is there any narrow content? And as you know, I think, yes, all content is narrow content. Some of it is indexical, hence it makes reference uh, to the external world. Now, uh, in the way of these things, uh, some philosophers have gotten carried away with this. Uh, and there is um, uh, a view that I've mentioned before, but I'll mention it again. I don't think it will last long, but these things do have a, a certain half-life. And it's called the extended mind. And it goes as follows. Uh, if functionalism is right, then mental states are really uh, causal states. But if you look at what causes what in my cognitive behavior, then there are all sorts of aspects of my uh, cognitive behavior that require mechanisms that are not between my ears. So for example, I couldn't give this lecture without this uh, thing hanging off my throat. But then if functionalism is right, this, there'd be no principal distinction for, for not saying this is part of my mind or these great notes that I try to make an effort to prepare here. Even that's, that size even better. Um, I can't read it anyway, but you feel more secure. You feel, I'm really ready for this lecture. <laughs> got these. That's part of my mind, uh, because it's one of the causal mechanisms that enable me to produce a lecture. Now, I think if you get that result, you've refuted yourself. Uh, that is, that's a reductio ad absurdum of, of the functionalism. If functionalism were right, then all things that are not part of the mind would become part of the mind. Uh, all sorts of things that I uh, carry around with me, uh, which enable my mind to function. I'm at last learning how the damn thing works. It's kind of fun. I, I, I'm not trying to sell it to you, but, but it is, it, 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 put it this way, it's a substitute for doing real work. Uh, to mess around with your uh, I, uh, what do you call it? iPhone, to mess around with your iPhone. And I, I, I dread the thought of getting an iPad, because that's probably even more fun to goof off with. OK, is this part of my mind? No, it's not. It's just a tool like any other. All right, questions about that? Yeah, you had your hand up. Yeah. I, I think you can say that it's not part of your mind, but 
the way that you decorate your room or yeah. the programs that you have on your computer, it seems like they are, if not part of your mind, an ex at least an extension of you. Absolutely. Yes. No question about that. Everybody agrees, or at least I hope everybody agrees, that the mind manifests itself not just in your overt behavior, but in a way that your whole mode of sensibility uh, uh, creates a certain space in which you live, the kind of friends you have and the kind of relationships you have with the friends, that, as you said, the way you decorate the room, the kind of car you drive. All of these are expressions of yourself. And, and one of the things you're supposed to get out of a good university education is a different self uh, from the one, uh, from, uh, uh, from the, the, the thing that arrived here from high school. I dread to think what that was like. But in any case, something did happen. No one is challenging that. The question here always is a philosophical question about the nature of the mental. And if functionalism is right, well, I don't think it is, uh, for reasons I've given you before, but if functionalism is right, then there's no principled distinction between what's inside my skin and what's outside my skin. Because there are causal relations both inside and outside my skin. And I think there is a principal distinction. The principal distinction is what's inside my skull has consciousness and intentionality. And indeed, there's a connection between consciousness and intentionality that I haven't explained to you yet, but I will. Uh, uh, before Easter, we'll, we will know the distinction between, uh, we'll know the relation of consciousness and intentionality. Yes. Well, let me uh, make naive realism consistent with internalism. Okay. Now, uh, the secret, the key to understanding these points is to see the special characteristics of intentionality. Now, the point about perception is that the intentionality of perception isn't like the intentionality of belief, where you can kind of shuffle your beliefs around at will. I can think about my belief, who's going to win the next election, and what's going to happen in Libya, and can the giants repeat. I can think all those beliefs, I can shuffle them around. But when I hold this thing up and look at it, I can't shuffle anything around. It's not up to me. And I put that by saying I get a direct presentation of the external world when I perceive it. Now, that's the characteristic of the presentational intentionality of perception. And I call that a version of direct realism or naive realism because it says you really see the real world. All right, but now the traditional philosopher is going to say, yes, but supposing you're having a hallucination. Suppose it's hallucination. Okay, well, let's suppose it is a hallucination. Then I still have the same mental content it's still exactly the same conditions of satisfaction as before, but they're not satisfied. So the condition of satisfaction of the hallucination and the condition of satisfaction of the so-called veridical perception are exactly the same uh, because the condition of satisfaction is built into the structure of the experience. But the difference is in one case it's satisfied, in one case you got it right, and in another case you didn't get it right. So naive realism isn't inconsistent with internalism. In a way, I, I think it is a natural consequence of internalism if you get the story about intentionality right. And, and I think, as I, I keep saying over and over, the greatest disaster in the history of philosophy the greatest disaster in the history of philosophy over the past four centuries was the rejection of naive realism. And I think the reason all these great thinkers rejected naive realism about perception is they didn't have any conception of the intentionality of perception. You remember Hume just talks about impressions. They're impressions of sensation. But the idea that these impressions of sensation are intrinsically, essentially, referring to something else. That is to say, when I have this impression, it's an impression of something. That is lost in Hume. It's just you have these impressions, and they're just, as he says, each one is a separate uh, and individual entity and independent of all the others, and then you're off and running with classical epistemology. Kant made a desperate and heroic effort 
to solve Hume's a skeptical problem, but it's the usual baby bathwater problem because he threw out the real world uh, in his uh, solution uh, to Hume's skepticism. He throws out uh, not knowledge of things in themselves. You can't have knowledge of things in themselves on the Kantian story. Uh, okay, but I want you to see how, I mean, that's a very deep question that you ask, and I want you to see how the there is a, not just a connection between naive realism and internalism, but a proper conception of the specific form of the internalism about perception implies naive realism. Did you have your hand up, Jennifer? Did you want to say? No, okay. Uh, okay, any other questions? If now we're going to go on and talk about, oh yeah, here we go. I'm going to get a drink of water, hang on. Yes. Uh, the question is, is there a difference between the object of the intentional state and the content? And the answer is absolutely. That's the whole point about intentionality, is that intentionality has a content which fixes conditions of satisfaction, and they will be satisfied, the actual conditions of the intentional content will be satisfied only if there is an object there that satisfies those conditions. So I'm, I'm, you must be bored with what, what I happen to find in my pocket, but here are my dreadful pile of keys. Um, and I have keys to three houses and three offices and three cars. That's why I have so damn many keys. Uh, uh, my Freudian psychoanalytic friends shake their heads. Yes, sure, we know. It's really innocent. Uh, they don't think so. But in any case, I'll let you look up what it's supposed to symbolize. But the, uh, here are these uh, uh, damn keys. Now, when I see these keys, or I'm looking for my keys, as I often do, why doesn't everything have what the cell phone has? You dial a number and it rings where it is. But well, maybe some guy will invent that, where the keys, where you, when you lose your glasses or your keys, you simply dial their number and they'll start ringing. But in any case, here are my keys, and the keys are the condition of satisfaction of this ex experience. That is to say, the presence and feature of the keys are what mu they must be there if the ex experience of, that I'm now having of seeing my keys is satisfied. The seeing is the content. It sets the conditions of satisfaction. The object seen is the object. Now, as we've seen earlier, it's typical of uh, in intentionality of perception that it requires a whole state of affairs to be satisfied. So it isn't just the object, but rather the fact that the object is there and it has such and such a feature. Those are the conditions of satisfaction. So I, I do see that. that is, I want to make sure I answer this question because it's a deep question about the nature of intentionality. All intentional states have a content. That's what makes them intentional, is they're about something. So, uh, typically, that content will be satisfied, and it's satisfied by an, uh, typically by an object. So if I believe that Barack Obama is in Washington, then the object of my belief is Barack Obama, the actual guy. The content of my belief is the mental state that represents him and represents him as being in Washington. Now, again, the traditional philosophers say, yeah, but what about the kid who believes that Santa Claus comes on Christmas Eve? What's the object? And the answer is, there is no object because Santa Claus doesn't exist. You can have a content without an object. And this, as I said, if you, if you go through this deeply, this is a, involves a very deep mistake. The mistake, can be, uh, the, the, the traditional uh, uh, philosophical account involves a very deep mistake. When you have a hallucination, you're aware of something. When you see something, you're aware of something. So it must be the same kind of a thing in the two cases, because the hallucination is indistinguishable from the non-hallucinatory case. That is a disastrously bad argument, because the sense of of is, the diff is different in the, two case, in the two cases. When I see this cup, I'm aware of the cup. That's the of of intentionality. The cup is the object, and the awareness is the content. But when I'm aware of a hallucination of the cup, the of there is the of of constitution because the awareness and uh, I, I, the, the awareness 
and the hallucination are identical. It isn't that the hallucination has an awareness of something else. Rather, when I'm aware of the hallucination, the awareness just is the hallucination. Whereas when I'm aware of the cup, they're two different things. The, and that, there's the awareness and the cup, and that is to say that that awareness, the of, there's the of, of intentionality. I'm aware of the cup. But, and the, but the cup isn't identical with the awareness. But when I'm aware of the hallucination, the hallucination just is the awareness. And again, you might, that might seem like a dumb mistake, but it pervades uh, the standard authors. It pervades the past three centuries of epistemology. Yes? Yes, uh, I'm wondering if your um, uh, theory of uh, impersonality of perception doesn't need uh, a more sophisticated form of uh, realism than the naïf one. Yeah. I'm thinking uh, about uh, the, your admission uh, in your uh, theory of intentionality that the world presents uh, to everyone under some aspects, yeah. uh, not uh, the same for yeah. everyone. Yeah. Uh, uh, and in different contexts, it is possible that we perceive something different. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, uh, we perceive something. Yes. Uh, I agree with uh, uh, this form of realism, that in every case there yeah. is the object, there is the world. But how the world presents yes. to me or to the other... It's different from other people. Different, yeah. different uh, networks, different uh, uh, backgrounds, yes. Okay. And uh, I think that uh, your theory of intentionality uh, um, would be uh, compatible, but uh, more uh, needs uh, um, uh, of some sophisticated form of theory. Okay. All right. So Let I me I respond to this question. Uh, uh, Professor Di Lorenzo is a famous Italian philosopher visiting uh, from Italy, and she asked the following question. Don't I need a more sophisticated form of realism than this dumb, naive realism that I have been urging? Because, she says, I, given different backgrounds and different skills, the same people in the same situation will perceive different things. That's absolutely right. And, I, and my naive, the word naive is meant to annoy people, that's all, and I probably shouldn't call it that. I, 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 I better word would be direct realism. And the whole point of saying is direct realism is to say, you don't see something else by which you infer the presence of the object. You see, on representative realism, you never see your hand. You just see a kind of picture of your hand, and then you infer the presence of the hand. Now, my version of realism is opposed to that. Mine says, no, you just see the damn hand. It's kind of a boring example. You can't do better than that. You know, we better have lunch first or something. But in any case, it, it's direct realism because there's no other thing that gets between you and the object you see. Now, the point you're making is a different point, and that point is about how our perception is structured by our background abilities. Somebody who actually knows something about music will hear things in the opera that I don't hear. Uh, my little sister was a, a, a music major, and I, we take her to the opera, and I thought it was a great performance. And she will say things like, the tenor was half a beat off through the second aria. Well, she could hear it. I couldn't. And there are all sorts of things like that. Now, uh, I, uh, watching a ski race, I can see who is holding the turns right and who isn't. But that's because I've done this kind of dumb stuff. Uh, but I've never I, I, I sung as a tenor, oh, thank God, uh, uh, I mean, for the poor victims. But uh, in any case, what you see will be a function of your skill. It'll be a function of your background abilities. I, and indeed, I mentioned movie making. Movie makers rely on this uh, because often you just get a few hints. You just get a, uh, uh, a few uh, 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 small gestures or uh, casual things that are said. So that's a separate issue, independent of naive realism, is the, is the question, how is it that our intentionality rises to the level of our background? abilities. You don't just see colors and shapes, rather you see cars and houses and people. And indeed, if, you, if you're a specialist, 
You don't just see cars and houses and people. You see a split-level ranch house that, sell, that used to sell for about $550,000 and so on. A real estate person will see all kinds of things that we won't see. And a car freak will see all kinds of features of the car. You don't just see a black car. Uh, you see a Porsche 911 Carrera C4 model 993 uh, and, and, and so on. And you will, I mean, people notice a little dent in the rear fender, things like that. Uh, a guy came to my office once and said, there's a crack in your rear bumper. You know, well, it's been there for some years. I mean, it isn't I'm losing sleep, but he, ought to, he thought I ought to be losing sleep. He can see things that most people don't see. Yes, Jennifer. In that case, wouldn't you want the most watered-down version of realism possible since we bring to it our own <coughs> cultural uh, train capacities yeah. to slice up the world the way we want it? So, say we take a uh, or whatever to um, Papua and New Guinea, and yeah. uh, Let's say some sort of pre-linguistic society. They wouldn't see it as a. They won't. Whatsoever. Yeah. No, but this does, doesn't water down naive realism. This strengthens it. What it says is, the the condition of satisfaction of your actual visual experience will involve all kinds of detail. Uh, you don't just uh, hear music, but you hear a specific aria in a specific uh, opera sung by a specific uh, a tenor. And similarly, uh, you don't just see uh, a car, but you see a specific car. And if it's your car, you see a car belonging to you. Yeah. My point is that you don't want to come down too heavily on a theory of ex uh, the external world. Yeah. You want that as bland as possible. What you want is a rich internal Yes, okay. No, I, I agree with that. That is to say, the world cuts up the way we cut it up, and the way we experience it will be a function of the kind of skills we bring to bear. Okay, now I want to go on and talk about causation, but I want to make sure that everybody's uh, uh, up with us on, on the, the relation of intentional content and intentional object or any questions about this kind of stuff. Let's go on and talk about causation. Now, when I talked about uh, the mind-body problem, I have to talk about Descartes. When you talk about causation, you have to talk about Hume. Uh, Hume uh, is the all-time champion on the topic of causation. And in fact, if you've never read it, you should read uh, Hume's uh, famous uh, destructive, skeptical account of causation. It's in Book One, Part Three of Hume's treatise. And it's very hard for me to believe that the guy actually did it when he was under the age of 25, but he did. I mean, I, I have to believe that, uh, because it is a stunning piece of philosophical prose. Now, it does have a problem, and that is uh, he was having so much fun, and he's so excited that he keeps repeating the same damn points over and over. However, uh, it's pretty good stuff, and also there is an, a, a lot of good stylistic points. Um, uh, so, for example, if you want to know how to use the subjunctive, Hume was a master of the subjunctive. The subjunctive has kind of fallen out, and not only in English, but in other languages, even French, uh, the subjunctive is dying. Pauvre subjunctive, poor subjunctive. Um, I don't know why the hell it's dying. I kind of like it. But it survives in odd little corners of English, like, far be it from me to lament the decline of the subjunctive, the be there that's in the subjunctive. Um, but I, in, in any case, Hume's a wonderful stylist, and you should read this. I'm now going to give you a, a rather uh, a straightforward uh, pedestrian, in, un, inelegant summary of Hume. Here's how it goes. Hume says, if we're going to understand the nature of our knowledge of the world, we have to have an account of causation. Why? Because all of our knowledge of the world that goes beyond immediate experience depends on causation. Uh, if I believe that Barack Obama is president of the United States, or I believe, to take a human type example, that the sun is going to rise in the east tomorrow, it's only because I accept the idea that there is a causal structure to the world. Uh, that there's a previous history that causally impacts on my present experiences and that my present experiences can give me knowledge of the future uh, because I accept a certain set of causal principles, that the principles that made the sun rise in the east today will continue to operate and so the sun will rise in the east tomorrow.
So causation is essential for our understanding of reality. What are the components of causation? Nowadays, we'd say, what's the definition of the word cause, or what are the truth conditions of causal statements? But he says, what are the components of our reasoning concerning cause and effect? And he says, there are three components. One is priority. The cause has to come before the effect. C before E. In a limiting case, they might be simultaneous. But what you cannot have is uh, the effect coming before uh, uh, the cause. Now, that's rather depressing if you think about it, because you think there are a lot of things that if I had known in the past, I could have done them right, and that would have prevented things from happening in the way they did happen. But why can't we go backwards? That is, I brush my teeth today, so I won't have decay uh, tomorrow, right? But why can't I brush my t teeth today to make it the case that I didn't have decay yesterday? Why can't I go backwards? Why are we so prejudiced this way that we can now act so as to make things be different in the future, but we can't act so as to make things be different in the past? Well, we can't. Now, Kant made a big deal out of that. Kant says, well, that's what Hume neglected. He neglected the fact that time I, is one directional and it requires causation. I'm, but I'm just pointing out what Hume says, that he says that priority of the cause before the effect is essential to the notion of causation. A second notion, he says, is contiguity in space and time. I, if I blow my nose in Berkeley and the Eiffel Tower falls over in Paris, nobody would say, well, my blowing my nose caused the Eiffel Tower to fall over unless you could show a causal chain, unless you could so, show some causal connection. So the cause and the effect have to be next to each other. And in cases where they're not next to each other, there must be a chain of cause and effect by which the initial cause is linked to the subsequent effect. Uh, the initial present cause is linked to the distant effect. So causation involves priority and contiguity. What else? Well, says Hume, there has to be a necessary connection. There's got to be some necessary connection between the cause and the effect. It can't, causation can't be just one thing after another happening uh, near something else. It's got to be some link. There's got to be a causal nexus, link, connection, force, power, efficacy. Now comes his first great skeptical conclusion. He says, I can't find a necessary connection. I look around everywhere, and I just don't see a necessary connection. Now, Hume makes it look as if he just didn't happen to find a necessary connection. But in fact, he knows he couldn't find a necessary connection because there couldn't be such a thing the way that he has described the case. That is, I observe a cause, and that cause is followed by an effect. What's the connection between the cause and the effect? Hume says, I can't find it. But suppose somebody says, oh, well, I do find it. Uh, I find it in a further event, call it uh, A, that connects C and E. But that won't do, says Hume, because now you need a connection between C and A and A and E. And even if you found those connections, B and D, it's still no good. Now you need a connection between A and B, B and A, A and D, and, and D and E. To put this in one sentence, Hume talks as if he didn't just happen. He just happened not to find a necessary connection. But that the way that he has set up their case, there couldn't be such a thing. There cannot be a necessary connection between the cause and the effect, because each event is a distinct existence. And the mind never perceives a connection. I'm using Hume's jargon here among distinct existences. Now, you might say, no, look, we find all kinds of necessary connections. So if I turn this light on and then turn it off, flipping the switch, causes it to go on and off, but there is a necessary connection. There's an electrical current, and the completion of the circuit caused the electrical current to go to the tungsten filaments in the, in the bulb, and that activates the filaments, and, and the, the electrical energy is converted into light energy. 
uh, there's intervening, intervening processes. Okay, but that still doesn't solve Hume's problem. Because again, what's the necessary connection at each stage of the proceeding? By, I mean, yes, you flipped the switch and the electrical current went through, but what's the necessary connection between flipping the switch and the electrical current, between the electrical current and this, uh, uh, the act, uh, activation of the filament, between the filament and the light? There is no experience of necessary connection, and there couldn't be the way that he has described it. They're just one event after another. Well, says Hume, this is terrible. I mean, he's being ironic, of course. Uh, this is terrible. There's got to be a necessary connection. There has to be a kind of glue that holds the universe together. And that glue is the necessary connection of causation. Well, now, now he really gets going. Now he's uh, uh, having enormous fun. And he says, let us examine the components of our reasoning concerning cause and effect. <clears throat> and he says, there are two components to our reasoning concerning cause and effect. They're the principle of causation and the principle of causality. Causation says every event must have a cause, and causality says like causes have like effects. So, says Hume, well, if these are true, if every event must have a cause and like causes have like effects, then we can justify our reasoning concerning causation because we know that any event occurs, there has to be some cause. And furthermore, if we find the cause, we know that like causes will have like effects. Okay, now he says, but how do we know that these are true? How do we know that it's true that every event has a cause and like causes have like effects? And he says, well, they're not true by definition in a contemporary jargon. They're not analytically true. It's not part of the meaning of the word cause that every event must have a cause. The meaning of the word event or cause aren't such that every event must have a cause. There might be things that just happen, just like that. And furthermore, it's not part of the meaning of the word cause uh, and like, uh, that like causes have like effects, that similar causes have similar effects. So these are not true by definition. They're not analytic, so they must be synthetic. They must be empirical truths. They must be statements that describe the general character of nature, and as such, they are justified by evidence. But now, and this is his second great negative skeptical conclusion, there is no way you could ever justify either of these by adducing evidence. Why? Because the evidence only counts as evidence if you assume a causal structure to the universe, if you assume that like causes have like effects and that every event has a cause. Now, the first skeptical conclusion is skepticism about necessary connection. And he says there isn't any such thing as necessary connection. The second skeptical conclusion is called skepticism about induction. Uh, and Hume is supposed to have shown that we are not justified in accepting inductive arguments because every inductive argument rests on a principle of causation, on causality, and we cannot justify uh, causation and causality without uh, presupposing them, without taking for granted that there is a causal structure for the world. Now, this is a, such a famous argument, I'm going to go over, uh, go over it in a little more uh, detail. There is in Hume a tacit distinction between uh, two types of reasoning, and this distinction is very heavily embodied in our culture. It's the distinction between deductive arguments and inductive arguments. And I won't write them all on the blackboard, but the standard philosopher's example of, an, of a deductive argument is all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. Now notice, in a deductive argument like that one, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal, the premise is implicitly contained 
in the the, the conclusion is implicitly contained in the premises. There's nothing in the conclusion, Socrates is mortal, that wasn't implicitly in the premises, Socrates is a man and all men are mortal. In a deductive argument, all you do is make explicit what was there to begin with. There's nothing new in a deductive argument. So we might say in a deductive argument, as far as the information is concerned, there's no new information in the conclusion. All of that information is in the premises, and we might say that one way to represent that is to say the premise must be greater than the conclusion. In a limiting case, they could be identical. You can deductively infer all men are mortal from all men are mortal. So that in a valid deductive argument, the premise has to contain the uh, conclusion, and the premise, therefore, must contain more information than the conclusion, or at least, I, I, in a limiting case, they could be the same. But the problem with deduction is you never get anything new. How do you ever discover uh, that all men are mortal in the first place? To do that, uh, you have to have a different type of reasoning where you get something new in the conclusion that wasn't in the premises. Now, we don't use the notion of conclusion and premises, but we talk about evidence supporting a hypothesis. In the case of an inductive argument, you go from evidence to H, and you say the evidence supports the hypothesis. But in the case of the inductive argument, there's always more in the hypothesis than there is in the evidence. Maybe just for the sake of matching, I'll do it this way. The evidence always contains less information than you have in the hypothesis. Otherwise, you're just repeating the evidence. There's got to be something new in the hypothesis. So you have the law of gravity. Bodies attract according to the inverse square law. How do you get that? Well, you do a bunch of tests, and then you find out, yes, it works. You can make predictions and test the predictions on the basis of this assumption. You go from evidence to hypotheses, where the evidence contains less information than the hypotheses, the hypotheses contain more information than the evidence. In the traditional philosopher's jargon, you go from some to all. You go from observed instances to unobserved instances. You go from evidence about the past to a conclusion about the future. So you say on the base of your experiments, all bodies attract. Or you say, uh, because of our evidence about the solar system, we know that the sun will rise in the east tomorrow and will continue to rise in the east tomorrow, even though both of those are unobserved. We haven't observed uh, 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 the, uh, the uh, hypothesis that we're uh, defending. We've only observed the evidence on the basis of which we conclude the hypothesis. Okay. But now then, the question arises, how do you get away with it? If it's the case that you go from evidence to hypothesis, where you got something in the hypothesis, where the hypothesis was bigger than the evidence, how do you justify it? And the answer is, it's not arbitrary. We have certain rules. And those are the rules of scientific evidence. So given the evidence, if you follow the rules of scientific method, you can support the hypothesis. You're justified in affirming the hypothesis. OK, now here comes the crucial question. What justifies R? How do you get away with saying R is justified in using uh, this form of argument? And here is where Hume's skepticism comes in. You cannot say that R is true by definition. A typical way to put R is to say, you assume that like causes have like effects and that every event has a cause. Or you assume that nature is uniform. Or you assume the future will resemble the past. Or you assume unobserved instances will resemble observed instances. Hume says those are all essentially the same. They are all assuming a causal order to the universe. How do you get away with that? What's the justification for the assumption? And here is his second great skeptical conclusion. He says, there's no way 
you can go from evidence to R because any such move as that where R equals H uh, has to presuppose R. You're supposing on this side what you're already trying to prove on this side, and that's circular. Now, let me just summarize that, because that's the most, Hume's most important conclusion. It's called the problem of induction. His first skeptical conclusion was, we never observe causation in nature. All you find in nature is one event followed by another event. You can observe the sequence of events, but you cannot observe a causal connection. As Wittgenstein said in the Tractatus, the belief in causation is superstition. It's a kind of superstition that people have that they believe there really are causes and effects in the universe. There aren't. What actually happens is one damn thing after another, literally. However, uh, Hume says, we still have to use causation in our reasoning because any conclusion that we have that goes beyond our immediate experience rests on a principle of causation. It's because we have to assume that there is some kind of order in nature, otherwise we can't get new information. We can't go from evidence to hypothesis without supposing Nature is uniform. The causation is a part of nature. Uh, like causes have like effects, and every event has a cause. The future will resemble a past, and so on, with all the other ways of putting what Hume says is essentially the same point. But now comes his second great skeptical conclusion. You can't justify that. You cannot justify the belief in causation or in the uniformity of nature or that the future will resemble the past because any effort to justify these presupposes what it's trying to justify. In order to go from E to H on the basis of R, you have to assume R. But if you try to justify R by E, you say you go from E to R, well, that can only work if you presuppose R, but that's circular. You're presupposing on this side what you were trying to prove on that side. I want everybody to see this because it is uh, it's Hume's most, uh, uh, most important philosophical result, and it continues to bother people after all these centuries. I'm going to later on, I'm going to answer it, but I want you to see the power of the argument. Now, Hume always has two ways of doing his uh, uh, questions in philosophy. First, he gives you the skeptical story. You can't really know that, uh, that you're the same person today as the person you were yesterday. You can't really know that material objects continue to exist when you're not looking at them. You don't have any reason. But all the same, your bad habits will come to the rescue, and I will explain to you how will you will continue to believe in this superstition of causation, even though there's no justification for it at all. So that's his positive account. A negative account is skeptical. Positive account is accept the skepticism, but show how we can still continue to use the notion that he's just exploded. Now, as a kind of a digression, I want to say there have been lots of efforts to answer this argument. When I first read this argument, I was a 17-year-old kid starting philosophy for the first time, and I thought, I can answer this guy. Here's the answer. We know that the future will resemble the past. We have very good evidence that the future will resemble the past, because what was once past, future is now past. Uh, future and past, Hume talks as if they were names of fixed parts of time, but they're not. They're always relative to a point of view. And what we now think of as the past was once the future. Now, in the past, we have discovered that past pasts resemble past futures. That is, we discovered that things uh, last Thursday were a lot like they were last Wednesday. But last Wednesday, Thursday was the future. So we discovered last Wednesday, the future does resemble the past because what was once future is now past. And in the past, we discovered that past futures resembled past pasts. I hope everybody understood that. It's not a very good argument, but I was only a kid. Okay, does everybody see what the argument is trying to show? It's trying to show we have very good evidence that the future does resemble the past once we abandon the assumption 
that past and future name sort of fixed uh, areas and recognize that no, we've had in the past a lot of experiences whereby the future resembles the past. It's just that those were cases of past, pasts, and past futures. Okay, it's, that was my argument. Now, but that's not a good argument, as you can see if you think about it for a moment, because what Hume is saying is not, did past futures resemble past past? We agree that that's so. Our question is, what happens next? Do we have any grounds for supposing that the future futures, that is to say future from right now, will resemble the past, that is will resemble pass from this particular point. See, we all believe that if I drop this piece of chalk, it will fall to the ground. Hume says, what are your grounds for believing that? Well, I know the law of gravity, and I have a, I have a lot of experiences with dropping bits of chalk, so I have all kinds of evidence. And Hume says, all of that is irrelevant. That law of gravity, that's supposed to be more than just a summary of past experiments. But all of your evidence that this thing will fall to the ground is so much superstition. You have no evidence that it will fall to the ground because all of your evidence is about something else. It's about what happened in the past, what happened in other cases. And what I want to know is, do you have any ground for supposing in this case it will fall to the ground? And Hume's answer is no. You have no basis whatever for your belief that the sun will rise in the east, or that, as Hume says, if we believe uh, that water re refreshes us or that uh, uh, food nourishes us, it's not because we have any evidence, it's just it costs us too much pains to think otherwise. He's going to explain how, because uh, we, we have carelessness and inattention, he says, come to the rescue. So when you come to my philosophy seminar, Hume says, I can convince you, you have no rational ground for your beliefs. But when afterwards we all go out and have a beer in the pub, you'll forget all about the philosophical skepticism and behave with the idiocy that you behaved with before you ever studied philosophy. But that's perfectly all right that you should be an idiot all day long, except for the few minutes when I, in which I teach you how to think, because this idiocy enables you to survive and go on without being crazy. So now he's going to tell us the origin of our idiocy. But I want you to see the power of the argument. It's a very powerful argument. Step one, there's no such thing as causation in nature. They're just sequence of events. There is no glue that holds nature together. No force, efficacy, power, necessary connection. Those, he says, are all words for the same thing. And you can never perceive any of those. All you ever perceive are sequences of events. Step two, when you try to look and see how you would justify the belief uh, that there are such things as causes in nature, you come up with two principles, causation and causality, but neither of those can be justified. They're not true by definition, and they can never be justified by evidence, because the use of any evidence to justify anything presupposes those principles. Different ways of putting them, you can say uh, the future resembles the past, uh, like causes have like effects, every event <clears throat> has a cause, uh, there's an order in nature, <clears throat> um, uh, unobserved instances of a phenomenon will resemble observed instances, but Hume says those are all pretty much different ways of saying the same thing, and you have no rational grounds for accepting any of them. Okay, so that's Hume's skeptical argument. Now, I want to take questions about that. I want to make sure everybody understands that. Because that is a, a very important result in the history of philosophy. And indeed, it's this result uh, that Kant... Uh, uh, Kant was a smart guy living in Königsberg, and he was sort of a follower of Leibniz. And uh, Leibniz uh, had a popularizer named Christian Wolff. And uh, uh, Kant was a Leibnizian. And then he read this, and it was stunning. He said, it awakened me from my dogmatic slumber. So Kant then went to work to try to answer Hume's skepticism. And now what I'm going to give you, give you, now give you Hume's skeptical solution to this problem. Questions about what I said. Everybody got it. This is the famous problem of induction. Okay, here's his answer. 
he says, well, <clears throat> when we were beating around the bush to try to find the principles of causation and cause and effect, we didn't find any necessary connection, but we did find something. What we found was that in our experiences, the thing that we call the cause is always followed by the thing that we call the effect. That we didn't find any way to justify the principle of induction, but we did find that when we drop these damn pieces of chalk, they fall to the ground. So we have to give up on necessary connection. We didn't find that, but we did find something else, and he calls that constant conjunction. We find a constant conjunction of resembling instances, and that's kind of short for we discover a regularity. We discover regularities in our experiences. We discover a regularity by discovering that the thing we call a cause is followed by the thing we call the effect. And that, he says, sets up a certain set of expectations in the mind. It's true that we have no rational ground for believing that if I drop this, it will fall. But you do have a kind of expectation. Imagine me letting go of it, then you will imagine it falling to the ground. The present impression, says Hume, is associated with a lively idea of it falling to the ground. And uh, if you even just close your eyes and form the idea of my, my releasing it, that, yeah, that will be followed by an idea of it falling to the ground. So though there's nothing in nature that corresponds to necessary connection, there is something in nature that we've discovered namely a constant conjunction of resembling instances. And the constant conjunction of resembling instances will enable us to find truth conditions for causal statements. There's a fact in the world that makes it true that A caused B, even though those, there's no necessary connection between A and B. The fact in the world that makes it true is that events of the A type are always followed by events of the B type. And we know the name for those constant conjunctions. They are called laws of science. And so the idea that Hume comes up with is called the regularity theory of causation because it says there's no necessary connection in nature, no causal glue that holds nature together, but there are regularities. So what fact makes it true that this event caused that event is not a fact about the events. It's a fact about laws. It's a fact that every singular causal statement has to be an instance of a general causal law. So the only reason that we can say that gravity caused <clears throat> the object to fall is not because there's a necessary connection between the object uh, and its falling. Rather, we can assimilate the instance of its falling to a general statement, a general rule of these constant conjunctions. Now this, as I said, is called the regularity theory of causation. So Hume came up with a negative conclusion. There is no such thing as causation in nature. Ha ha, but there's something else. And that something else is regularity. And that's what science discovers. Science does not discover causes in nature. What it discovers are regularities. Those regularities are encoded in so-called causal laws. But they just tell us regularities we have discovered. There's no reason to suppose they'll continue to operate in the future. But because they have operated in the past, we get certain illusions. We get certain habits of the mind and we get the habit of expecting the effect to occur whenever we observe the cause and imagining the effect to occur whenever we imagine the cause. And it is, Hume says, this felt determination of the mind, that's his jargon, that leads to the illusion of necessary connection. Necessary connection is not in nature, it's in us. And because we have these habits of the mind, of habit of expecting the effect whenever we see the cause. And because of that, we mistakenly suppose 
that the necessary connection is a feature of nature. We read off the features of our mind onto nature itself. We suppose that because we naturally expect, we feel ourselves determined to expect the effect when we think of the cause or see the cause, that expectation we project onto reality and we think then there must be a causal effect, a causal necessity in nature. Now, one of the appealing things of Hume's whole account is it's independent of his sense data theory. It's independent of the phenomenalism uh, in his account of perception. A naive realist has to answer Hume. Naive realism about perception doesn't answer the problem of causation or the problem of induction. The problem of causation is, well, is there a real relation in the real world whereby one thing makes something else happen? That's, and he says, no, there's no necessary connection. And the problem of induction is, what ground do we have for supposing that our observed cases will resemble unobserved cases, that the future will continue to resemble the past? Okay, that is the most spectacular, those are the most spectacular results that Hume ever got. Uh, and let's stop for a question about either of those. I'm now going to answer them. I, I think Hume's mistaken, um, but uh, it's, not, it's not a trivial uh, a point uh, to criticize Hume. It's a, it's a serious philosophical endeavor. Okay, now everybody's up. Yeah. It's taken seriously in philosophy, but this is just a philosophical Well, they don't consider Hume a problem, but an awful lot of uh, people in the sciences think, look, we don't discover any causation in nature. What we discover are mathematical regularities, and that's all we want. What we want is formulae. Can you give me the mathematical formula? And indeed, in subjects which are less uh, uh, self-confident than physics, subjects like economics, People feel you haven't really made progress until you've got a formula, until you've got an equation uh, whereby you can state the regularities. S equals I. I has to, savings equals investment has to be like F equals MA. Force equals mass times acceleration. So it's true that they're not worried about Hume's uh, uh, skepticism about necessary connection, but, that, but it's generally accepted. Uh, in, uh, in um, the more mathematically advanced sciences that what we want are mathematically statable regularities. And you remember Davidson's anomalous monism rested entirely on a Humean conception of causation. And uh, you'd be surprised how many contemporary philosophers accept it. I don't, but most of my colleagues do. Von Wright, a very smart guy, and his book on uh, uh, this stuff says, there is no such thing as a causal uh, uh, order to nature, uh, there just are regularities. Unfortunately the, uh, for, fortunately for us, these regularities are discoverable, and that's what science does. Science does not discover causes, it discovers regularities. Now, again, I'm like uh, Voltaire trying to explain the Catholic Church. I don't believe any of this. I think all this stuff is wrong, but I haven't told you my view yet. I want you to understand the power of Hume's view, and I think most people will tell you, it's generally believed, and probably correctly, uh, that Hume is the greatest philosopher that ever wrote in the English language. Not as smart as Kant, but pretty smart. Uh, and that the best thing in Hume, the most powerful passage in Hume, is his skepticism about causation and induction, is uh, uh, book one, part three. And if you're really going to narrow it down, it's sort of the battle at Gettysburg uh, of, of Hume is book one, part three, section 14. Uh, and have a look at that, because that's where he really uh, he, he, he cuts it loose. He really is. Uh, it's a tremendous fun to read it, because you can see he had so much fun writing it. Yes? I see that if you want to show how inductive um, reasoning is valid, you have to kind of assume that you're going to get some kind of reasoning that makes sense. But isn't, could you say that the same goes for deductive reasoning, that the only way to show that deductive reasoning is valid is yeah. to assume deductive? Okay, no, but now this is a, a, a good point, and some people have made this point. Let me repeat it for the folks at the back. I said Hume proves you can only uh, justify induction if you presuppose induction, because any evidence for inductive reasoning would, have to, would only count as evidence if you assume induction. But can't you say the same thing about deduction? Can't, why can't you have skepticism about 
uh, uh, deduction and say, well, look, deductive reasoning is only valid uh, because you presuppose deduction. Uh, so uh, it's true that I say uh, all men are mortal and Socrates a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. Uh, but why don't I say I, it's true that all men are uh, mortal and Socrates a man, therefore Socrates eats spaghetti. Why not? What's wrong with that? Uh, you won't get you past the, uh, you, you won't pass logic using uh, arguments like that, but why isn't that just a prejudice that uh, you're conditioned by logic professors? They beat in you a certain kind of uh, subservience to the dogmatism of deductive logic, but it's a faith like any other. I, I think there is a standard answer to that, and that is the reason that you get this certainty in logic, the reason for the, the validity of deductive logic is you don't actually go anywhere. You just stay in the same place. Uh, you don't actually get any new information out of a deductive argument. Uh, and if you're going to say, well, you need deduction to justify the conclusion, you need to assume some principle of deduction to assume, to get the conclusion that Socrates is mortal from all men are mortal. Socrates is a man. If you thought you'd need deduction for that, then you'd need it for any premise because P implies P. That is, all men are mortal, therefore all men are mortal. That's a deductive argument. What do I have to assume for that? Nothing. There's no additional assumption in a deductive argument because uh, the, uh, the information in the premise is not new. It's already there. It can be surprising. We can be astounded by proofs in geometry uh, but that's due to our psychological limitations. If we were God, we could see immediately the conclusion from or the conclusions from all of our axioms. Uh, now, there, the the the, all, the other view, the view that says, no, no, you got to assume a bunch of principles, that creates problems. Uh, that creates a paradox known as the Lewis Carroll paradox. I can't tell you everything in lecture, so Google the Lewis Carroll paradox, and you'll see what happens if you think uh, you have to have separate principles of deduction. I think we're running out of time, and even my most attentive students are busy looking at the clock. So let's stop here, and I'll tell you the correct account of causation next time.